thank you all very much for coming. Um, so, if you uh, looked at the history of the last 30 or 40 years, it's possible to paint, in fact it's very easy to paint a very dark picture of it. We've seen the sort of collapse of welfare states, the atomization of society, when, because we've all been told that the only important unit in society is the individual. And in, in fact, society doesn't even really exist. That's a kind of socialist conception that was dreamed up by the Russians sometime in the early part of the last century. And we've seen the consequences of that, the decline of um, free education, for example, of the welfare state, the breakdown of communities, the destruction of the unions, which of course were attempts to create communities within working people. Um, it's a pretty dark story. And on top of that dark story, we've seen a lot of people telling us that that was actually a kind of success, that the destruction of the state was a sort of success because it led us to this utopian neoliberalism that we're now experiencing. Now, that utopia kind of crashed in 2008 and people suddenly realized that the story wasn't panning out as uh, it was expected to. And then last year, um, 2016, things really seemed to hit a pretty dark place as um, what were called the populist revolutions happened. Um, the interesting thing about this book for me is that it's actually a very optimistic book. It tells that story of the sort of loss of a certain vision that existed after the war, which was a quasi-socialistic vision, or it was a kind of capitalism tinged with socialism, you might say. So we, we know that story. Um, we, know, we know what's happened there. And it makes last year look like a pretty bad year. What's interesting about this book, I think, is that it makes last year look like the beginning of something new, something interesting. Um, what Chris has done is looked at the forms of social action and changes in social thought that have been fermenting underneath this, the official story of what's been going on. The official story of the success that very few of us seem to have benefited from. And I've known Chris for quite a few years now, not as a writer, but as the vice chair of Stop the War Coalition. <laughs> Quick action there. <laughs> just, just crush it with your hand. <laughs> Um, um, so, Chris has been the, probably I would say the key figure in organising the demos, the big demos of the last 15 years or so, since 9-11. Um, and so I've known him as somebody who's a very effective organiser and somebody who doesn't just talk the talk, but walks the walk. So it's unusual for a writer to have have this sort of activist tinge as well. So he's a real activist and a successful one. And in fact, a lot of this book is about activism. And it's a kind of exhortation to activism and a defense of it in the face of um, a very substantial intellectual movement that has been arguing that that kind of thing doesn't work. Um, we should just all sit, sit down and get with the program and not try to be activists. You know, if you think of the books by people like Fukuyama and Steven Pinker even, um, this idea that, this sort of Panglossian idea that the world was inevitably going towards this golden age, um, which they're still trying to claim despite what has happened in the last 10 or 12 years. So this book says, no, the world isn't going towards that golden age, but it might be going towards something interestingly different and better. So now I'm going to hand over to Chris, who's going to talk about the book for a bit, and then after that I shall ask him some taxing and difficult questions. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Thanks very much for, for that, Brian. That's very kind. It's a um, very good, probably better than I could do, introduction to the book, actually. Um, Thanks also to all of you for coming and to Rosie and the team at Waterstones for putting tonight's event on and actually to uh, my publisher, 
uh, Doug Lane and the others at Zero Books, who did a brilliant job of turning this book around very, very quickly, actually, which I think was very, um, very important. Um, there was actually quite a few people in the audience who have been part of really writing this book, is the truth. I think all books are much more collective than uh, authors maybe make out, but this one particularly is a very much a, a, a collective uh, enterprise, and I thank them because this has been part of a kind of it's the product of a series of discussions, really, that have been taking place amongst some of us for, for quite a time now. And I think when I sat down to write it last year, basically, it was uh, to respond to two things. We had a sense that um, the commentary at, and even parts of the left, were massively underestimating or ignoring two things in particular. One was the depth the sheer scale of the crisis that faces the British establishment. And the other was um, the extent of the anger and the politicisation and the radicalisation that is going on in British society. Um, and I have to say that in the period since I wrote here, I feel, um, or I feel that we are vindicated by events, um, and some really. Um, if you look at the situation now, I mean, we don't really have a government in this country. We have a bunch of... Um, sort of egomaniac, privileged, overprivileged uh, individuals who are running around fighting each other, freelancing, and really doing no government business at all as far as I can see. And the only thing that's holding them together, the only thing that's stopping that becoming a, a completely all-out war within the Tory party is the fear of a socialist government or a left-wing government. Um, so, uh, you know, that's the kind of... Um, desperate situation that the main party of the uh, ruling class is in. And, you know, I can't tell the story. The first half of the book is a kind of story. I don't want to tell the whole story. I just want to touch on a few issues around the kind of crisis that, uh, that they're in and, and the radicalisation. And I think that, you know, it's not just a case of uh, talent deficit, poor leadership, corruption, sleaze, you know, all that is there at peak levels. But I think um, something much more fundamental is going on here. I think that there's a real problem that they face with a complete lack of direction, a complete lack of any kind of plan, really, for British capitalism. Um, and you can see that, obviously, that takes the form partly of the, this devastating row over Brexit, which is splitting the ruling class and causing all sorts of problems. But it's not just about Brexit. It's actually more fundamental than that. It really is. There is an impasse about the project, about the neoliberal project. The version of neoliberalism that's been applied in Britain has, I mean, it's, been, it's massively benefited the elites in a kind of uh, open, structural, sort of social robbery kind of way. But the rest of it is entirely bad news. I mean, you know, it's immiserated uh, the majority of the population. Um, it's led us into a series of disastrous and deeply unpopular wars. And it's also, and I think this is crucial, it's also failed even in its own terms. It's failed incredibly publicly, not just the, the banking crash, although that was crucial. But, you know, everything that they said about neoliberalism, that it was going to have a tri trickle-down effect, it was going to restore productivity and profitability, it was going to stabilise the country, it creates efficiency, all of these things have been seen to fail, uh, have been seen to be uh, completely untrue. And so... I think the situation is one in which, um, you know, you don't have to be Antonio Gramsci to realise that a combination of kind of soaring inequality, mass immiseration and very public project failure is not a good look for any elite. And I think it actually is the definition of a, of a kind of crisis of hegemony. Um, and, and it's been accompanied uh, by the second thing, which is, you know, a, a real politicisation, a real radicalisation, which... As Brian said, I think it was largely unnoticed, but it's very, very serious. I mean, I had some graphs up there, but unfortunately the, the laptop has broken. So I, I won't go into the, the, the detail, but one of the things I do in the book is look at the public attitudes over the, the development of public attitudes and public opinion over the last few decades. And what you find is that not just that all the kind of basic tenets of free market um, economics have been rejected, you know, people are pro nationalisation, they're for more taxes, they're against corporate power, therefore more trade union power, a more trade union influence and so on. And that's been a growing trend. That, and it predates Corbynism, interestingly. Um, and, and, and I think what's really worried the elites is that it's not just an issue by issue thing, that 
in, in the last few years, it's began to coalesce into a kind of broad, popular, left-wing political programme. And uh, I will just give you one quote, actually. Could you just hold that a second? Sure. Just one quote, which is quite interesting, which, which I think... You need a mic stand. <laughs> just for a second. Um, in 2014, the editor of the City AM newspaper complained in an article titled there is sadly mass support for nationalisation and price controls, that, quote, slowly but surely the public is turning its back on the free market economy and re-embracing an atavistic version of socialism, which, if implemented, would end in tears. Um, now, as I say, that's 2014. That's before Corbyn came on the scene in the, in the way that he has. And that's an interesting point. Um, by early 2016, the guy was proved right. Most polls since then have shown that more people are favourable to socialism than capitalism in British society. You know, it's an incredible development, really. So, um, actually, there's just one more element in terms of the public opinion, which I think is important, is that it has found, and this is something that before Corbyn has been excluded from the history largely, it has found a kind of organised expression or a series of different kind of organised expressions. Um, and one of the things I argue in the book is that First of all, since the beginning of the 2000s, this has been a series of mass protest movements which have had a huge impact. And then, of course, more recently, it's now been crystallised and coalesced and given massive energy by the emergence of um, uh, Jeremy Corbyn right at the centre of the Labour Party, which has is, which is, which is given it a huge, uh, a huge boost. So, so that's the sort of general picture. And you know, I think it's very important that this is... My aim here is to analyse history and to try and tell a story, but very much with a view to, um, to what it means for the present and the future. And um, one thing, the most obvious point, really, for me, is that this story um, warns against the siren voices who are saying that to be successful, Corbyn and Corbynism has got to tack to the centre ground and has got to make compromises, otherwise they'll never get elected. It seems to me the absolute opposite is the truth, is the truth that, you know, it's not being radical that's toxic. It's actually looking like the status quo that's the problem here. And, you know, you see right across the, the world the centre uh, the centre collapsing. So, um, so that's the sort of general picture. I just want to make a few final points, a more general um, conclusions and kind of arguments that I make in the second half of the book, uh, which partly relate to the debates in society and partly, partly relate to debates on the left. One is that... I think we need to avoid uh, the temptation, which is very, very strong, to overplay the power of ruling class ideas and ideology. Um, in the academic left, it's incredibly fashionable to think that we all live in some sort of ideological prison house and that there's no escape and that you know, the media is all powerful and that no one can understand the world and so on and so forth. It seems to me, you know, and it's not just Foucault and to some extent Chomsky and the postmodernists and so on who, who, who commit these uh, mistakes. These ideas, I think, have a wider, uh, a wider influence. I mean, one of the reasons I'm old enough to remember, unfortunately, that one of the reasons that Neil Kinnett used to shift the Labour Party to the right in the 1980s was Murdoch's all powerful. Everyone's bought into the market. If you can't beat them, you've got to join them. Literally, he said that. That's a quote. And this was, you know, this was part of the justification used. So I think it's very, very important. And what I argue for in the book is a much more nuanced understanding of the way ideas develop in society. And that the, the Marxist tradition that talks about, that understands both the resignation and the rebellion that can be a product of, uh, a, 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 of living under capitalist society. The second thing is um, just a word about class. Because I think it's remarkable the extent to which class has been written out of accounts of recent history, written out of understanding of society in general, actually. And again, sometimes this is on the left. I mean, you know, there's a guy called, um, uh, what's his name, Guy Standing, who does the stuff about precariats. Again, working class doesn't really exist. It's all changed. Paul Mason, I mean, whatever his strengths, you know, he, he, he argues for in a different way the working class is finished. Um, you know, you see this at all different kind of levels. There was a BBC survey a couple of years ago that, took, that said, it was, what class are you in? And it asked all sorts of questions, about, and it had about 20 different classes, by the way. Asked all sorts of questions. It was mainly, where do you shop? You know, what designer clothes do you wear? Well, who are your friends? It didn't even ask the question, what is your job? 
You know, there's this constant attempt by sociologists to kind of underplay class, which actually isn't shared by the British population. I mean, it's, an un it's a fact that's not often um, reported, but 61% of British people self-define as working class when asked. And I think this is, it, this is one of the keys to the sense of surprise that all the commentators had about Brexit, about you know, the, Cor the Corbyn phenomenon, about the Scottish independence, but about the general turbulence. They don't understand that the experience of being at the sharp end of neoliberal capitalism has been horrific, and it has shaped people's ideas, and it's shaped people res people's responses, and that's essentially a question of class. Um, and the very last thing is, again, something that I think has been massively underplayed, neglected, and sometimes just, you know, completely ignored in the development of, uh, of, of these events. Has been, I've mentioned it already, but I want to come back to it has been kind of mass participatory politics, mass movements, campaigning, protest politics, all of these things. Because there has been, whatever anyone says or thinks, there's been a massive increase in the amount of protesting that's been going on. Actually, that's been stretching back for the last 20 years or so. And for me, um, you know, and again, it's written out of a lot of the left-wing histories. The books on Corbyn, many of them are very good. Most of them don't even mention the fact that he's been involved in all these campaigns. And I think that's a big mistake. And if you stand back and think about the last 30 or 40 years in British society, it seems to me that there is very, very little that has been more important and more influential in shaping British history than the series of social struggles and social movements that we've had, whether it's the anti-Nazi League in the 1970s, the campaign for abortion rights in the 1970s and 80s, the, the minor strike, actually, obviously in a negative sense from my point of view, um, the poll tax demonstrations, which not just ended the poll tax, but actually, in the end of the day, I think most historians would sort of privately admit now, brought down Thatcher. Um, the anti-war movements, the anti-austerity movements, the pro-Palestine uh, campaigns, all of these things have had a massive effect, not just in terms of sometimes winning, sometimes losing, but also shaping the ideas that exist in uh, British society. And, you know, I, I, I think this is something that, it's, it's a terrible shame that, that this attitude is taken by many people to understanding the recent past because I think it's, you know, it's not just a, pr a problem of interpretation, it's also crucial when we think about how to go forward and how to respond to the current situation. Um, because, I mean, look at the situation today, you know, lots of people are saying, oh, just let them fight amongst themselves and fall and then everything will be fine, you know, we shouldn't do anything or interfere. It seems to me this is particularly a moment where we shouldn't allow politics to become a spectator sport, where we should be thinking, each of us, what can I do to put this government and the country out of its misery as quickly as possible? You know, that should be the attitude that we have uh, to this particular moment. Because, you know, allowing a fatalism, allowing events to unfold is a very, very dangerous thing. And all sorts of bad things can happen if we have... Uh, that attitude. And I think as well it's important for the future. Because it seems to me that not just longer term history, but recent history has shown absolutely clearly that anyone who thinks that just electing a new government with a new set of people running, uh, 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 running, running, you know, in number 10 and running the cabinet and so on and so forth, anyone who thinks that just that process, important though it is, is going to be enough to turn back the massive um, changes that we've seen over the last 20, the terrible changes that Brian talked about, or is enough to confront the powers that are ranged against us, I think is actually living in a kind of fantasy land. I mean, we've seen how low the media can go. You know, it's been an absolute education, I think, even for people as, um, as, as, as with as long a memory and as cynical in some ways about ruling class institutions as me. I mean, you know, it's been absolutely... We've seen the sort of forces of the state in the wings threatening Jeremy Corbyn. We've seen how the Labour right has done everything it can to sabotage the project, undermine the project, and actually it's had some success, by the way, already, particularly on questions of foreign policy. So I think it's very important as we move forward in a situation which is a very exciting one for me. You know, it's the, 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 the emergence of Corbynism especially when properly understood, opens up all sorts of possibilities, massive possibilities. It forces the, 
the establishment onto the back foot, it creates the possibility of massive change. But I think we have to hold on to that idea that it'll only be effective, it can only be pushed through if it's accompanied by actually a deepening of social activism and social movements and the participatory side of the left, rather than any kind of sense of, OK, it's over, we've got the man in. I think the day Jeremy gets elected, I'll be celebrating, but I'll also believe and think that that's the beginning of the struggle, by no means uh, the end. And so that's not, I mean, this is an optimistic book, promise. I mean, it's not in any way a council of despair. <laughs> I'm not trying to be negative. I just think it's important we're honest about the balance of forces and, you know, we tell the truth about the situation. It's also, by the way, um, a way of kind of reasserting what I believe is an absolutely central truth, that uh, socialism is nothing if it's not about active involvement, popular involvement. It's nothing if it's not um, about active self-emancipation of millions of people. So I guess I've given away the end there. But anyway, thanks very much. <laughs>
which was equally baffling to them. They, they fully expected a Brexit, you know, a Remain vote, um, just as they fully expected a wipeout by Theresa May. So, um, so those, those are instances of the loss of control. But which, which other ones would you point to? Yeah, I mean, obviously the, the title is in a way a bit provocative because, I mean, you know, the, the ruling class still own the means of production, they still own the businesses, they still uh, are in place in Whitehall and all the other uh, institutions. But I do think, uh, you know, there has been a, 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 a big a series of challenges to that, to that control. And just to give you, I mean, in, in a number of different registers, one is... They've stopped getting the election results. They've stopped getting the political results from uh, from the political process that they want. You know, I mean, and they and not only that, but the, the results they're getting are ones that are deeply challenging to them in many cases. I mean, they nearly lost Britain in the Scottish independence. You know, that would have been dire. I mean, they were in serious panic mode. Um, the Brexit vote. I mean, it's a terrible situation from the point of the ruling class. Whatever you may think about the Brexit vote. The truth is, we now have the situation where the main party, the British ruling class, is having to pursue a policy of breaking from the European Union that its main backers, the overwhelming majority of its main capitalist backers, hate and oppose. I mean, that's chaos. They really wanted to win that vote. And they lost it, and despite the fact they had most of the media on the side and so on, and then there's the Corbyn thing, which is, which is, you know, obviously, they tried, they threw everything at the problem. You know, he won two leadership elections, they all intervened in it, it didn't work. Then, he did much better than they could possibly have dreamt in the election. And in the face of, in the teeth of, mass, you know, the mobilisation of every institution of the campus, state, including the media and so on and so forth. So, I think that's serious. And obviously underlying that is, I argue, um, a, 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 a kind of critical moment, loss of control over hearts and minds. You know, I mean, I don't actually believe they ever controlled our thoughts and our, and our opinions. It's interesting, I go right back to 1979. There was never a time when the majority of working class people agreed with Thatcher, fact, or even agreed with any one of Thatcher's main policies. But that kind of opposition was very demoralised, very kind of subterranean. Now it has emerged, now it has become strengthened, now it is... You know, it's become offensive that people are saying, no, we want something different. That's a big thing. I mean, hearts and minds. If you haven't got hearts and minds, in the end of the day, you've got a problem because, as Brian says, the only thing you've got left is fear. Really. Um, so, I mean, you know, just those two things. I mean, I could go on, but the, I mean, the only other thing, they've lost control of their own side. I mean, that's clear. Look at what they've look at the last few days. I mean, that's quite important as well. Yeah. Well, the escalation of fear is, of course, a, a, a really big industry now. Um, it's actually what the defence establishment is mostly concerned with. I was talking to a friend um, yesterday who's been studying um, the FBI in America. He's, he's been making a film on that. And he said that um, after 9-11, when the FBI was so criticised for not having picked up all the warning signs of these guys who were going to fly planes into buildings, um, they decided they had to catch more terrorists. Well, catching terrorists is quite difficult, actually, because there aren't very many of them, apart from anything else. So they started to groom terrorists. And what, what they did was they would um, find people who were using those kind of jihadi websites, or look, even just looking at them. And then they would pick likely, likely candidates and start grooming them by putting out contacts who, who pretended to be jihadis who would then uh, offer them quite a lot of money to participate in bomb plots with them. And these plots were developed over months and months and years sometimes. And of course, at a certain point, it, it became crucial that the plots were in some, in some way carried on, because otherwise that's two years' work. Because, you know, and nobody's going to give you promotion for, for a plot that didn't happen. So um, <laughs> they ended up in one terrible case, actually, four um, young black kids uh, from Chicago who had been on some jihadi website, um, and the FBI picked it up and started grooming them, and first of all offered them $10,000 to put a 
bomb in the trunk of the car. And they didn't want to do it, actually. They chickened out. And the offer went up to $250,000. And eventually they accepted, because that's a lot of money. Um, never touched a bomb in their lives, but were arrested and are now serving 24 years each. Um, so so this, this kind of production of, of this system that is offering the only thing that the government can still offer, defense, you know, security, and it's a false security anyway. Um, so so that it's, become a, it's become the industry, actually. It's the main industry for keeping us quiet, I think. Can I just say on the, on the foreign policy thing? I think that's something we've lost control, the government's lost control of yeah. as well. I mean, you know, if you actually look at the result of these terrible wars over the last 60 years, 70 years, I mean, they've been catastrophic. But even in their own terms, um, you know, they, they to, the devastation, obviously, that the millions of people have suffered across different uh, parts of the world. But, you know, what is happening now, the Middle East in flames, um, Afghanistan, a failed state with a massive civil war going on, Libya falling apart, that wasn't plan A. You know, sometimes some commentators sort of imply this is what they wanted all along. Absolutely not. And, and you know, it's led to a situation of, of destabilizing European countries as well. It's had it's had that feedback, and I think I think this is I think the point that Brian makes about the way in which you know the military, foreign policy, these foreign wars have become very very important uh, for British capitalism in the 21st century is an incredibly crucial one because again there is this temptation even in parts of the left to say, oh, you know, the war stuff, it's a bit too hard for people, it's a bit too controversial, let's, let's talk about that later, let's get in power first. You know, I think that's a very big mistake. For me, one of the most inspiring, one of the most important moments of the election campaign was the day after the appalling tragedy in Manchester, when Jeremy Corbyn did that, had the courage and had the foresight to do that press conference where he said, by the way, foreign policy is the main driver of terrorism and of, of this instability. And you know, you could tell all the media were going, I don't believe he's doing this, you know, this is bad. The Tories were like rubbing their hands with glee, as were the Labour right, that's the truth. Next day they were all silent because the opinion polls showed that between 65% and 75% of the population agreed with him. You know so it's, so it is like, you know, we shouldn't have this idea that we can't raise these issues, partly mainly because if we don't, then we we it's it's too dangerous for our side not to. We have to because Theresa May would have used that whole thing as a return to order, you know, clamp down, Muslims are all to blame, you know, anyone on the left is a terrorist, blah blah blah. You can see what she did, the spark in her eyes, she saw that coming. And we can't let them do that. And and actually as well, it's you know, people have been one to these, you know, it's a fantastically precious thing that so many people are against foreign wars. We shouldn't lose hold of it. Yeah. In fact, I, I often think that Corbyn has already done more for British politics than anybody else for 40 or 50 years. Partly by, one, one of the main things is by proving that the media are not so important as they think they are. You know, after the election result, you suddenly realize that he hadn't played the game at all. I'm sure against all the advice that any sensible person would have given. He just hadn't played the media game at all, and it didn't matter. In fact, it even worked in his favor, I think. I mean, I certainly admired him for it. So anyway, on to another issue. You, you know this thing of the last few days, the Paradise Papers. Do you think um, that's also part of the, that kind of scrutiny that is now being turned onto the machinery of capitalism and wealth? Do you think that's also uh, a reason for optimism will pan out into some more interesting futures. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I don't, I don't think it can be a coincidence that just as, you know, the kind of neoliberal project is losing its popular legitimacy, that, that journalists, I mean, it's an organized operation, actually, the whole investigation, which is a good, a good sign. It's what's very interesting about it is that it involves 300 odd journalists yeah. who have managed to keep a secret for a year and a half. I can't believe that. <laughs> no, I mean it's, it's 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 a great thing, and I think um, it is part of the whole you know the whole sort of collapse of, of of confidence in the system, and that's great. And it will and it will definitely reinforce that 
you know, sense that there has to be change and there has to be alternatives and that something needs to be done. Having said that, I do also think, and I've come across this from lots of people in the last few days, or last, whatever it is, 48 hours, people saying, yeah, but I think we know this all along, you know, and I think there is some truth in that. I think the, the level of, I think even the journalists sort of underestimate the extent to which um, people already know this sort of stuff is, is, is going on and, and how deep-seated people sort of critique it. But I think, so there's a book that I can't remember now that talks about the different states of public knowledge. So stage one is, I know something's wrong. Stage two is, I know you know something's wrong. Stage three is, we both know that everybody knows there's something wrong. And stage three is quite different. That's, that's the point when suddenly the game doesn't hold up anymore because you know that it's common knowledge. And I, th I think those things like the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers are moving into stage three where suddenly everybody's aware and can't argue. You know, there's no defense. There's no, nobody's going to say, oh, you're just making that up. You're just paranoid. Um, so, so I think we're going into stage three on this at this point now. Um, I'm going to ask you another question. So, as I said earlier, that the one of the important things about Corbyn for me was showing that the media aren't that important any longer. Certainly not those, not those media, not the ones that we're traditionally frightened of. But um, is is it now a, a real issue that? there is not a sort of any form of reliable media presence now. The BBC, which at least until 10 years ago had a sort of feeling that there was at least conflict <laughs> about the views within the BBC. You know, there was an argument going on within the organization, which meant that you, you got views from a slightly broader range. That doesn't seem to be the case anymore now. Um, one of the things you talk about in the book is the way that the spectrum that's talked about has changed. So let's say in real life, left and right is a spectrum like that. Of course, it's many more dimensions than two, but um, let's say it's that spectrum. But what's happened with the BBC is that they're talking about one end of that spectrum and calling that left and right, which means that someone like Corbyn just isn't part of the conversation. He's not even on the spectrum as far as they're concerned. I don't, I don't mean the autistic spectrum. Um, but, so this this means that they're talking about a conversation that nobody is really having any longer. They're talking about, they're not including the views of all the people, the 61% of people who identify as working class, which I do as well. <laughs> At least in origin. Um, so, what what is where do we get information now, and where do we trust it from? From each other, I guess. And is that where we've always got it, actually? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's true. There's been there have been um, changes. I mean, the, the the mainstream media has never there's always been hostile in a general sense in, in in majority to the kind of aspirations of working people and left wing ideas. But it's become a much more polarized situation and I think you're right. I think you know I think what happened is the establishment, including the commentariat, in around the time of Blair's taking over the Labour Party, they did suddenly say, okay, socialism's over, it's all about the market. That was the moment. It was a very contradictory moment because it was also the moment when people voted most people voted Blair because they wanted an end to the free market, funny enough. So it was a very odd moment. But I think ever since then the establishment have thought these things are over. They can't believe it. The majority of people prefer socialism to capitalism. It's like they, that just can't, they can't compute that. And I think this is, you know, this is a, a, a reflection and a product of, a, of, a, of what is, I think, a very explosive situation where you have a ruling class that is essentially committed to this neoliberal project. Now, that may be around the edges beginning to break down in terms of, you know, there are some articles in the FT now saying maybe we need to reconsider the question of nationalisation and so forth. So it, it may be that the sheer chaos created by neoliberalism and the protest movement does actually push back in the mainstream to some extent, but it may also be that we just have a more polarised situation. And I think, you know, in those circumstances, two things are important. One is, for me, actually again, the campaigning movements, the protest movements, have in a certain sense carried their ideas with them. And, you know, the anti-war opinion that exists now in British society 
Party is a product of experience. Party is a product of those marches and protests and meetings and rallies and the websites and the leaflets and all that stuff that actually did reach millions and millions of people. You know, and we have to put our faith in that party, but also we do. The left does need to get its act together with the media. And I think the Corbyn, the Corbyn people did well in the election. I think they did fantastically well online, you know, the social media operation. We need to learn from that. And we need to think really big, you know. This is, this is more one of my main contentions, you know. If we have to fill the void. There's, these ideas are dying, they're going. No one believes them anymore. But there have to be other ideas, and there is a bit of a race between the left and the right. And therefore, we, you know, we have to, the important understanding of all this is to understand we've got to be incredibly, you know, on the offensive. We've got to think very, very big in terms of the kind of response the left um, has to this situation. Yeah, uh, we'll open it to questions now if anybody would like to ask Chris a question. Or me, if you do. There's a microphone roving in Rosie's hand, so if you need to ask a question and don't have a loud voice, you can use that. There's a gentleman here. Yeah. saying that if May had the election 10 days later, when the students were at home and on holiday as opposed to in university and as more likely to vote, we would have had the, the issues that May has with the small majority. How do you think about that? You know, by the time we got to the election, I think, you know, a lot of younger people were absolutely passionate about this, you know. And although obviously it was partly about the, the question of free education, which is a very, very important question, I mean, and in a certain sense, I don't think it was mainly about that. I think you're also talking about suddenly people think, oh my God, we have the chance to change things. We have the chance to do something different because I think people feel not just education, I think people feel the jobs market, the housing market, all of these things are making their prospects absolutely unbearable. And therefore, the moment that someone says, we're going to deal with this, we're going to start to deal with this, is the moment when people get, you know, I think people would have moved heaven and earth about wherever they're going. Well, and the other thing to remember is that prior to that election, of course, hundreds of thousands of people have joined the Labour Party. It's, it's the biggest political party of Western Europe now. So that, that surely does show an appetite that wasn't just that week's appetite. You know, you have to sign up sometime in advance. So so I think when people, you know, of all the people who are interested in politics, probably only one in five actually sign up to join a party, or one in ten even. So that represents a very big group of people, I think, suddenly becoming energized. And in fact, I would say one of the really big consequences of the last couple of years is that politics has become something that people want to think about again. Now, I, I have a lot of friends in the Silicon Valley tech world, um, partly because I lived in San Francisco for a few years, and they were so apolitical. Their whole thing was, you know, the, this sort of techno-utopianism that says the project is in hand, technology is going to lead us into the right future. We don't have to bother interfere with it. In fact, politics is so uncool. People used to say, we don't do politics. Um, there, there was this sort of idea that came out of Ayn Rand and all those very libertarian thinkers. And uh, I always used to say to them, yeah, laissez faire is fine, but whether you're laissez, those other people are faring. Because <laughs> all the time they weren't doing politics, people like the Koch brothers were doing politics, and Mercer and all these crooks were still doing politics, and had taken control of the whole system. So I think what happened certainly among a lot of my friends there, was last year they thought we really dropped the ball. We, we should have been engaged, but we, we weren't. You know, the thing didn't run itself. In fact, it ran in exactly the opposite direction that most of them wanted. So I, I think that's the other thing, that people have realized that not being engaged in politics is not cool any longer. Um, for quite a while, it was the cool thing to do, you know, like above all that, all that shit corruption and bribery. But, but I think people have sort of thought, oh no, 
this is how things get changed. Um, and so they're back into it. Happened to me, actually. I mean, I haven't been engaged with politics for most of my life. It's something that I became interested in again 12 years ago or something, really with the Iraq war. Hi, um, you were talking about the alternative media and social media and how that's played a part in this and um, it's especially helping break down the dominance of the mainstream media. But I was at a conference last week where people were talking about um, the, the other side of that, the flip side of that, the fake websites and accounts, the, the bots being set up by foreign powers or people who want to do harm, who want to, spend, who want to spread racism and hatred. And I'm just wondering how much we, how, there, there is going to be regulation, regulation is coming, or, uh, especially of Facebook. Uh, um, how do we make sure we protect these new alternative news sites what, in, the face, in the face of regulation of dangerous um, uh, websites and things? Yeah, that's a very good question. Do you mind if we take two questions? Uh, so I'm going to give you the mic so you can ask your question. Um, yes, my question is that uh, my daughter went to a uh, conference or something at the Barbican Centre last week and she told me about water and technology and what well, Ryan mentioned that kind of utopia, but no one mentioned class and she thought it was very peculiar. But uh, my question is relating to that. Uh, um, how that identity politics that's kind of all over the media now, is that part of the groundswell of the movement, the changing, or is it something sinister and kind of manufactured by the establishment? <laughs> Good questions, both. Yeah, that's lots of, lots of tricky ones. Um, I mean, on the, on the, the stuff around the, the internet, um, I mean, there is all this. Uh, understandable concern about you know so-called fake news and stuff but I mean it does make me laugh when you hear the sort of mainstream media people talking about fake news you know they've been delivering us fake news now for decades and decades think about the Iraq war the lies we were told about the Iraq war think about 2008 the banking crisis you know we weren't told half of what went on behind the scenes and the extent to which that whole operation was an inevitable outcome of deep-seated corruption in the financial uh, market. So, you know, I mean, I, that's the first thing I think we need to say in those cases. I mean, we, but you're right to say we've got to be very careful about regulation. Um, because, you know, who, who is the regulator here? Who's regulating? You know, that's, that's the question um, we have to ask ourselves. And I think, you know, um, we need to have a vibrant kind of movement for freedom of speech and obviously against the far right having um, having platforms in the, you know, the, in, in the media and so on and so forth. But as I say, I think the main thing is we need to establish our own media that is as strong and as far-reaching and, and well-organised uh, as we possibly can. Technology, you know, uh, uh, technology in class, I mean, we could talk for a long time about these things because it, it is very interesting. But there are all these ideas going around. Sometimes, you know, in, in Camp Corbyn, not Jeremy himself, but people around Called like Paul Mason's argument and others is that you know somehow the new technologies are going to inevitably usher us into a world of what do they talk about post I can't remember the phrase they use but you know that somehow of, of its own of its own accord the new technology is going to mean all drudgery is over and we're all going to live in a world of luxury and plenty you know this is a a, 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 a bad mistake because as you suggest. The way in which technologies are introduced, whatever their potential, and they do have, I mean, think of the potential the internet has. If we were living in a rational, really democratic society, the internet could help us solve a million and one problems very, very quickly. I mean, it has a huge potential for liberation for humanity, but it depends who controls it. And at the moment, we all know that it's in the hands of people who want to make money out of it more than anything, and this has a very, very distorting effect. And, you know, Let's face it, I saw, I saw a very interesting um, talk by one of the people that ran Bernie Sanders' social media, and she was saying, you know, be careful. Don't trust these platforms. Use them, but don't trust them, because you've got to think who owns them, and don't rely on them. You know, so we have to find ways of 
um, of using it. But the idea that somehow technology in itself and of itself is going to liberate human beings, it, it's another form of fatalism. It's another way of saying we don't have to do anything, we don't have to struggle, we don't have to campaign, you know. So, um, thinkers, uh, over the last 50 years or so, thinkers have desperately been looking for some kind of divine intervention like that. But it's, yeah, this is, what, this is the trouble when religion disappears, you just find it somewhere else. And the technology has been a religious cause for people quite, quite a lot over the last few years. Um, the question you asked about identity politics is something that interests me a lot because I'm very aware that the right uses <coughs> awkward little problems of identity politics to discredit the left. And unfortunately, the left is not sophisticated enough to realize that yet. So, so these sort of really quite minor issues about transgender lavatories and so on come to seem like huge issues. And of course, they can be made laughable. It's very easy to make those things seem ridiculously um, perverse and um, sort of selfish, if you like. Um, and they do it, they'll play it. So, so I think the left has to be a little bit aware that they are often handing out sticks with which to be beaten. Um, they have to be a little bit careful about that. Any more questions? Yes. We'll take uh, three this time. Just going up the Fibonacci series. Hello, Chris. Um, it's a sort of would you agree question, if that's all right. <laughs> or ask it. Um, and I just want to preface it by, by an observation which I think chimes with your book about the, the area I work in, which is education. I'm, I'm an activist in what is now the National Education Union. And what we see, I, I think what you've described generally, is what we see happening in education in that the, the neoliberal project for education has run out of road see that in Tory, you know, try, the Tories trying to come up with something new, the grammar schools, the forced academies, and it's not working. And what their project has created is a crisis in mental health for young people and a crisis in, in teacher supply. So, so they've run out of road at the same time as you've described as you've got the prospect of a left government starting to develop progressive ideas around education. So, starting to say that they, they'll roll back some of the clock or they'll, they'll bring forward a progressive plan for lifelong national education service. Um, and now the discussions we're having in our union, on the left of our, our union, is how we try to shape that. Because uh, what we're conscious of is not looking like we just want to turn the clock back to the 1970s, which wasn't a golden age. You know, I don't think there's ever been a golden age for education in this country. So, I suppose the question is, how does the left, how do you think the left shapes that? You know, do, do, would you agree what we're saying? We have to look forward, not, not back. And I think that would apply to the health service or, or to nationalisation of the railways. Not just saying we want to go back to what it was, but what's our vision? How do we start to shape a vision outside of the Labour Party that helps the Labour Party, that tries to shape the Labour Party, but has a genuine mass participation. And I, I think it's an exciting thing for us in education to start to think that we can raise ideas around a new vision for education. So it's a would you agree, or how do you think we, we take part in those discussions generally? Uh, yes, I've always had the uh, enormous respect for uh, Chris's sense of timing, but um, <laughs> But never more so than um, as I was on the meeting on the way to the meeting tonight, and I saw that 22,000 people were following on flight tracker uh, Prithi Patel's trip back from Africa uh, to London, um, and, and uh, she is now the ex-minister for international development. Um, uh, and by the way, uh, because uh, precisely of, of, of one of the Achilles heel of the British establishment, and that is their absolute addiction uh, to the State of Israel. That's really what's done for her, uh, to, be, uh, to be honest. She um, got um, ahead of even the curve of the British establishment on that, uh, on that issue. Uh, but, but the question I want to ask is actually about timing, and it's this. 
I think all the trends that Chris has described have crystallized in the desire for a Corbyn government. And it seems to me that the rate of implosion of the current Tory administration means that that may well happen uh, a lot sooner rather than a lot later. At that moment, I think we are going to be already behind the curve with this analysis. Because at that moment, something else is going to start happening. And I think something else is going to be this, that every left government is like a small child with a stick that pokes a sleeping dragon in the eye. It can provoke it, but it doesn't have the ability or the strength to resist it once it awakes. And I think the things that Chris have been saying, and this is what I wanted to comment on, is that if at that point all the forces in the wider movement, in the trade union movement, in the social movement, and the anti-war movement aren't fully mobilized, that will be a moment of danger when all the currents that Chris has described could blunder into a confrontation and be defeated and reversed. They could blunder into a conf in confrontation, or I should say, um, accurately perceive a coming confrontation and become victorious. But it will be, I think, a big moment of decision. Um, no, I mean, all very interesting questions about timing and period and so forth. I mean, I think Alex is right to say that, you know, it's not enough just to look back. Um, for, partly for the reasons that he says that, you know, this ne wasn't necessarily golden age, but also because, you know, history doesn't repeat itself exactly. And one of the things about the post-war period, the 1945 government, was that it came out of a period when, for all sorts of reasons, the establishment of the capitalist class, in part in, partly because of the war itself, had become uh, used to the idea of state intervention on a really quite massive scale. You know, it was part of the way, and this wasn't just true in Britain, it was true in all sorts of countries right around the world. It kind of fitted the needs of capitalism at the time for at least sections of the economy to be nationalised and run in, a, in, a, in that kind of way. And, and although there was resistance to nationalisation, there wasn't all out resistance. Um, and there wasn't, and Labour had been involved in the national government and, you know, in, in, in those ways the thing was easier. I think this time round, as Alistair suggests, that I think there will be much more resistance because, you know, you think of the extent to which capital is now, is now globalised, you think of the importance of the financial sector, which is the most globalised sector of the economy in the British regime. Um, you think of uh, the, the extent to which manufacturing is now, so, you know, is now a kind of internationalised operation. That whole process of saying this government it, it, it wants to intervene, is going to control the economy, I think will be a much more uh, open and confrontational resistance to it. So that's one reason why I think um, we, we need to sort of reassess the situation. Having said that, one of the things I also think about the movement at the moment is that people don't know enough history. And I, and I, I think we do need to learn from the past. Because, I mean, you know, the, hist the left theory in history, uh, left theory is nothing but the kind of accumulated and condensed and analysed experience of 200 years of struggle. And that's important, you know, we don't want to go into a period, a decisive period like this, without having learned the lessons of the past. It would be, um, it slightly bothered me the extent to which the 100 year anniversary of the, of the Russian Revolution has passed with so little, you know, because it was one of the defining moments, if not the defining moment of the 20th century. It was the one time when workers actually did manage to take over a country for, uh, for a short period. That's something we need to learn from, and, and, and also in a negative sense. And I absolutely agree um, about the about the about the difficulties. I mean, you know, we need to learn about what happened to. We need to remember if we don't already know, and learn, sorry, and learn if we don't already know about what happened to the, the movement in Greece. You know, we we need a new model here beyond electing a left government. And the best people from that whole experience in Greece will say to you. They made a mistake. They were right to support the Syriza government, but they took their eye off the communities. They took their eye off the streets. They took their eye off the workplaces and the universities. So that when it, the moment came when the EU forced the government to betray the, 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 the hopes of the people, the left wasn't strong enough to get out in the streets again, to push back, to organize in the communities and in the neighborhoods and so on and so forth. That seems to me to be the new side of what we need to be doing. 
we need to go into this with our eyes wide open about you know the, the, the relationship between mass struggle and independently organized mass participation and you know the, 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 the purely electoral parliamentary project. I want to go back to something that you asked a lot earlier about um, uh, the news of the internet, um, because I think that also has something to do with all of these questions. So earlier on, we, we briefly touched on how do people learn things anyway? How do people find out things? How is it that, um, I think, is it 40% of the readers of The Sun are Labour voters, aren't they? Yeah. Okay, so so that's very interesting. Is that, that this this magazine that that really exists to propagandize a particular point of view is spectacularly unsuccessful in doing it. So it seems obvious to me that people don't form their opinions that much from the places that we we kind of are given the impression they ought to, the news media and so on. So so I think. The way that people really start to understand things is really by talking to each other. You know, you get communities of people who kind of reach consensus, a consensus about what reality is. And I think that will be the future of news media, actually. You know, there are now all these interesting new news sites like Truth Out and Counterpunch and Intercept and Novara, lots and lots and lots of them. And gradually, people will start to learn which ones they trust and will start to support them. And if they don't trust them, they presumably won't support them. So there'll, there will be a sort of process going on in the next few years, a Darwinian process, as we try to replace the mainstream media that we don't, any of us, trust any longer. Um, and I, I think that's going to play out in some quite interesting ways. Um, and I think it um, uh, compounds all these issues we've been talking about. But, People now are in a state of quite a lot of confusion, I think, because we don't know where to look. We've realized that the, the mainstream media don't actually have a bottom line beyond which they won't fall. They will go all the way. You know, the, the, the incredible, the Daily Mail's 16-page um, attack on Corbyn the day before the last election. 16 pages, can you believe, of the Daily Mail dedicated to trying to stop people to vote for him. This is unbelievable, you know. This is the kind of thing that people used to say in very disparaging terms about East Germany or yeah. Ecuana land or places like that, you know. Um, well, we're doing it now, so, so we're ready for the next stage, I think. Oh, should we finish? One more question. Testing. I worry about the future. I worry about my kids and my grandkids and what world is going to be left when I've gone. Uh, I know you're involved in the Long Now Foundation. What, what could I do, we do, as a society to think beyond our own lifetimes, or even if you're a politician in the next four years. Is there a way we can start to think what we're going to leave behind, what we're going to leave for the future? Well, just asking that question is already a start, because in general we, we act as though there isn't a future anyway. You know, if you think about the time horizon of most business people, it's the next quarterly report. Most politicians, it's the next public opinion poll, or it's tomorrow's Daily Mail headline. You know, The time horizon has got so short that even to start to act as though there might be a future is, is the beginning of the solution. Um, to act as though there might be humans here with, with, with a world that they've inherited from us in 100 years time. So the Long Now Foundation is committed to thinking 10,000 years in advance which we know is a ridiculously long time bracket, but actually it highlights a lot of interesting thoughts because if you think 10,000 years, well, a lot can happen in that time. Our civilization could entirely disappear 
and be incomprehensible to the people of the future. So that, that impacts on a lot of things about how you think about how the world's going to work out. But I, I'm involved in another organization that I'd like to mention, <laughs> um, which is called Client Earth. Client Earth is an environmental organization that is a group of lawyers. And their idea is that if you really want to save the environment, you have to instantiate it into law. You have to make it a question of law. So it's enforceable, so it can be followed up, so it's invariable for all its use and so on. And so that, that's a kind of long-term thinking, you know, because environmental organizations in the past tend to get very excited about things until they got someone to sign a piece of paper. And then they go off and do something else. And the people who signed the piece of paper said, well, they're not watching anymore. Let's, let's do what we were going to do anyway. Um, and you know, this has been the story of these various climate agreements. The interesting thing about lawyers is that they're pedantic enough to keep at it. And they keep coming back and saying, you signed this. So, so that's a, I, although I'm, um, I, I suppose, an activist of some kind, I actually do believe that the rule of law is a very important part of, of the consensus that humans make with each other. And it, this is why the whole tax evasion thing is so disgusting, because that's a deliberate um, skirting of the rule of law by people who always tell us that we should obey the laws. Thank you there. Um, I guess in response to a couple of the points and questions um, um, tonight, um, one of the things I would say that we need to do is really to just get involved in lots of different political activities. I mean, the first thing that I ever did, I suppose at the age of about 32, was to go on the big anti-war demonstration against the Iraq war. And since then, I've done exactly that Chris and, and others are in, um, responsible for organising. And since then, I've been involved in lots of different things. And I think, uh, in, including like the student demonstrations where we smashed up the Tory party headquarters in 2010, which is magnificent. Um, and I think everything that we do like that, everything that we do in our communities, um, collectively, with all the different trade unions and different campaign groups and so on, not only um, gives the government a thump on the nose, but also changes us in the process, you know, helping us to see through the rubbish that's in the sun and, the, you know, and all the rubbish uh, newspapers and so on. I mean, one of the things that after the student demonstrations, we was invited over to Greece, because I'm going to bring this up because Chris mentioned it, but lots of different people in Greece did say to us that what we really need is one big united campaign to bring us all together so we can fight together, but it didn't quite happen in Greece. We did come over to Britain and then set up, the, for example, the People's Assembly, which you know is against austerity. And much like the Stop the War um, Coalition has brought together lots of different people from lots of different backgrounds to campaign on those issues. And I think that's really, if we can just get out there, whether it's you know, so many people against the cuts that are doing magnificent things, whether it's you know, LGBT groups, whether it's women's campaigns, housing campaigns, libraries, and whatever, all get together and do whatever we can to give that government the massive thumb on the nose that it needs. I, I just remembered a, a, a favourite book of mine is by the philosopher Richard Rorty and it's called Achieving Our Country. It came out um, in the middle of the 90s and interestingly he predicts Trump to a T in this book. He says the crisis of capitalism is going this way and this will happen and it's very, very prescient when you read it. But what what he says is that what we really should be doing is celebrating our past successes. When you talked about, you know, remembering the history of the left, you have to think of all of the things that the left did which don't get talked about that much. Like workers' rights, for instance, unionization, and the whole idea of giving workers some kind of dignity and saying that they do deserve consideration, which in other countries now has gone much further than here. You know, you have in Germany, it's absolutely standard for there to be working people on the boards, on the company boards. And it isn't a tokenism, it's not something just to look good. Those, those workers actually have a real input into the boards. So we, we have been on a road um, for quite a long time, and we, we don't advertise it very well. I think we don't do very well on self-promotion at the left, generally. We're always sort of seeing the 
darker side of the picture, the things that are wrong, and not not saying for now and again, you know what, we didn't do bad in the 20th century, actually. Just, just. <laughs> Can I just come back on some of the previous questions before we get involved in that one? Um, I actually just wanted to name check one person who unfortunately isn't able to, would, would have come, but isn't able to be here because of health issues. But um, a guy called Aidy Cousins, who wrote a very prescient article in 2012, which is on the Cantify website, which is called The Crisis of the British Regime. Um, I say that partly because, you know, I owe a lot of the book actually is sort of, you know, it was, was kind of came off that original um, argument, but also because he, 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 in that article, he makes some of the points about the way ideas change, and I think the, this is a very important set of discussions because Brian's absolutely right. You know, the Daily Mail ran what was it, 16 pages on the day before the election, didn't work. It'll probably be to do 24 pages before the next election. That won't work either. That's the truth in the current situation. And not to say that these things don't have any impact, but you know why is that? And I think the most important reason is, and the, and the, and the reason why people don't quite are surprised by that, is because they underplay the extent to which ideas are formed more than anything, not solely, but more than anything, by people's experience, by people's actual experience of life, and their comparison of that experience with the ideas that are being pumped out by the by the mainstream. And you know, the problem is, from the point of view of our rulers, that when those two things diverge too far, there comes a point where people start to say, not just I don't agree with them about this, but that maybe they're lying about the other thing as well. In fact, maybe they're lying across the board. And I was talking to a, a, a long-term activist from Hungary um, a, a while ago, and he was saying that, you know, back in the day under the Stalinist regime, there came a point in about 1981 when people just stopped believing anything the media said. You know, this is sort of typical. That is the stage three, yeah. Now, I mean, you know, you can argue with with there now. I don't think we are there now. But that is a thing that happens, um, and it's and it's a very it's a very strong limit to, uh, to 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 propaganda. And you know, what has been happening is that is that one you know part of that process is that people start to make up their minds on the basis of their experience and they start to develop ideas. And that's actually what Marxism, you know, it's a central kind of idea of Marxism and whole revolutionary and uh, uh, socialist politics is that, is that the experience of living under capitalism for those who don't benefit from it is, a, is, a, is in general, most of the time, a radicalising thing. And, you know, that's what we're back to. Um, and, you know, people talk about short-termism, it's absolutely right, you know, rampant and murderous short-termism on the part of the elite. But, but people are, 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 are trying to think about that. You know, people are trying to think, how do we deal with, you know, the energy problems? How do we deal with climate change? How do we deal with these catastrophes? How do we deal with the war? You know, ordinary people are actually engaging with those issues and trying to think way, of ways forward, trying to think of ways that can start to solve some of these problems, which is why Corbyn is so popular. And, I think the crucial thing here is that those ideas develop and, and they happen not spontaneously but as a part of a process. The question is, can they be kind of articulated and organised and, and, and brought together in a way that creates actual social forces where instead of just, uh, instead of just, um, uh, just opinions? And that seems to me to be the real challenge that we face, you know, and, and clearly the the people, Corbyn and the people around him, they've done some of that job, and that's brilliant. But but it's a kind of job at the top of the of, of the pyramid. We need to do the job uh, 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 across the rest of society. And we need to, part of that is dispensing with the idea that politics is just what happens in Parliament. You know, because that's what they want us to think, really. And it's not true, it never has been true. Like you say, I mean, you know, I think almost all the good things in life have been won by people taking the streets and struggling. That's the truth. I mean, it's incredible history that is largely ignored. And we have to, we have to think about that, and not just think about it. We have to start strategising. And I mean, you know, just finally, I think the point John made is, is is absolutely right. You know, it's not just about having a kind of lots of spontaneous mass movements and campaigns. It's about thinking, how do we make those political? How do we make those things relate in a good way, a benign way to the Corbyn project? How do we move things forward? How do we 
how do we create an overarching strategy in some way to um, to, to 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 deliver um, this this kind of change? And you know, one thing I'd say now is, you know, I think we should be campaigning as strongly as we possibly can to get rid of this government. I think that would be a very is a very very popular thing to be doing, and it would be great in itself because it would you know bring an end to this misery at least for the time being. But it would be great for one other reason, because the, ma the means of their departure matters. You know, the way in which they go matters. Obviously, if they implode and it just falls apart in the election, that would be good. But imagine if they are actually brought down, at least partly, by ordinary people taking to the streets and protesting. Then, not just would you definitely get a better election result and a bigger majority for Corbyn when the election came, but you'd be entering the period of, you know, the new set of, new phase of struggle, with Corbyn in a position of strength, in a position of mobilisation, in a position where people were already participating in organising. So that sense of a kind of, you know, it's not just about single issues, it's about building a movement that actually involves, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of people. It seems to me that's the real prize.